This is Rafi Guzon, and you are tuned in to Nothing But That Sports Talk. Get you in the game. Yeah, welcome to another episode of Nothing But That Sports Talk. I'm Rafi Guzon, and the conversation of the upcoming HBCU All-Star Summer Classic of Rucker Park continues. We have a special guest, Coach Wooten, coming on the show. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's always nice to connect with another HBCU alum, alum or anybody that has like literally a vision of HBCUs. Absolutely. I'm a proud graduate of the Virginia Union University. Virginia Union University? Yeah, that's a nice school. Yes. I'll about it. But um, yeah, why don't you talk to me a little bit about how your basketball career all got started? Okay. All right. Well, so again, I'm so excited and want to thank Rachel uh, for connecting us because she and I go way back. And um, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. I got recruited by the late legendary Tricky Tom Harris. He recruited me to Virginia Union University. And let me just say, I'm actually a product of Title IX. I came out in the late 70s. Basketball was not a thing for women. I actually played volleyball and softball. And my freshman year in high school, they started the first girls basketball team at my high school. I went out for the team. My sophomore year, I fell in love with it. Basketball kind of stole my heart. I loved the fact of the competition, the competitiveness. And I remember some seniors on my team said, hey, if you keep on playing, you'll get a scholarship to college. And I'm like, a scholarship to college? Okay, that sounds great to me. So fast forward, I accepted the scholarship to Virginia Union University, a historical black college and university, because I also had offers to the PWI. Well, let me tell you why I made my decision. I made my decision. I met a football player that says, this is how you make your decision. If you want to be with your people, come to Virginia Union. If not, you don't. And then he said, you can also be this big fish in a small pond. So I took his words of advice and I, I, I signed with Virginia Union and I have no regrets. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. I mean, why don't you, like, like, why don't you, I mean, to continue the conversation, go like, why don't you tell me some of your best and worst basketball stories you've had during your career? Oh, you want to go back to high school or we're going to talk about college? Any story you can think of. Okay. All right. So my sophomore year in high school, um, I was so excited about playing the game of basketball. And that's when my uh, notoriety started. You know, I was out there competing with the guys. I come into practice and my, my coach was like, wow, I can't believe how great you or how good you've become over the years. So I started getting articles. And I remember one particular game um, I had played because I was really aggressive. And they said an article came out and said, Wooten, ask woman no longer. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, I was just excited about trying to steal the ball because I know once I stole the ball, I can go and get free layups. So that was a memorable part in my uh, career in high school. And um, by the time I became a senior, we had uh, been Cincinnati champs for my three years. Uh, I made all city. I was the Ohio player of the year. I uh, took our girls basketball team to the first state championship in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And unfortunately, we lost that game. But that's when I got a chance to meet. Um, uh, I just lost his name, but I, it come back to me. He played at Ohio State. And uh, he and I got both honors for me being the girl uh, player of the year. And then, of course, him being the uh, female player of the year. And um, and so I did. I came on to Virginia Union. Uh, it, it was just interesting, the camaraderie, how people uh, uh, supported us in your own skin. And I was like, wow, I'm going to take this basketball further. I'm going to go into college and, hey, hopefully we'll win the championship. And so by the time my sophomore year came in college, there I was again, being one of the top players in the CIAA. Uh, matter of fact, I made um, all CIAA all three years. My junior year was a pivotal moment for us because we lost our head coach. We were right in the middle of a basketball game. It was a few minutes before halftime. And our head coach had um, fallen to the floor and later realized he suffered a heart attack and he passed on us. And at that time, I always say he was like an angel for us because we were up by one point and we ended up beating Norfolk State by one point my junior year. So we won the CIAA, I believe the first HBCU in the CIAA to win a back-to-back. -back. And then my senior year, we played Norfolk State one more time. We lost because the foul got called on our center who went to contest the shot. We were up by one point. And, of course, the young lady went to the free throw line and she sank both free throws. And I remember being in line and we were just kind of joking with the uh, women on Norfolk State's team because we had, you know, become very good friends. And that was before they left the CIAA. 
And uh, we remember saying, okay, y'all got the CIAA, but we're going to go get the NCAA. And fast forward, we went on and we were on a mission, and there we found ourselves in the championship game uh, against um, Cal Poly Pomona out of California, and we won that game. And um, I got uh, ESPN's most versatile player. I snagged uh, 15 rebounds, and I scored 25 points. Wow, that that, that I, I can see why the CIAA is literally an important tournament. And uh, yeah, isn't that isn't CIAA like don't they usually have conference tournaments like during the March Madness season? Because I seen because I well I didn't exactly watch a game, but I kind of seen highlights and clips of the CIAA games. Like since you actually played at that played for a team at that conference, like won't you tell me how important it is for CIAA in the HBCU basketball community? Well, you know what? It is so important because think about it. Like, again, I came out of high school in 1979. So, again, a lot of those talented ball players didn't have places to go. A few of them got rec recruited, recruited to the PWIs. And I always said at that time, I really felt uh, 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 very passionate that they were just recruiting us for our skills and our talents. They were not recruiting us to get an education. And so when you think about the importance of an HBCU, that basically affirmed us in our skin. I felt good about who I was. I didn't have to assimilate. I didn't have to associate. I didn't have to be anybody I didn't want to be. And so at the time when I joined the CIAA, maybe like three or four years later, we were the second largest basketball tournament in the whole country. Now think about that. We had legendary players that did not get accepted to the PWIs that had no choice but to come to the HBCUs. And, you know, we talk about the day because things have changed and a, young, a lot of young people want to go D1. They want to go in and play for those top schools. And I've had friends that played at, D, at D1 schools at PWIs, and they did not have that same experience that I had being at an HBCU. Knowing who you are, feeling good about in your skin, you know, supporting each other uh, and, and just being in our own environment. And so the CIAA, oh, wow. That was big. I'll tell you another quick story. Coming out of Cincinnati, Ohio, because I lived in the Midwest, most of the games were attended by both, you know, white and black, because I lived in that mixed community. And when I got to the CIAA my freshman year, we were playing at the Norfolk Scope. And when I looked up into the crowd, it was amazing. Because I was like, wow, all of these black people are here. I had never experienced playing in front of a large crowd of black people. And, you know, their attire, the way they carried themselves, you know, how well they spoke. And it was just like a whole new world for me. And I was like, I like this. I really do like this. And so, yeah, the CIAA is so important. Uh, talented young ladies. Um, and that's why I actually started my women's professional basketball team, because I knew that the WNBA is dominated by Division One ball players, And very few of the women that come out of D2 CIAA, the MEAC, et cetera, they don't get that same opportunity to compete. And some of those women are just as talented, if not talented, than some of those young ladies that go on to play at the PWIs. Exactly. I mean, you mentioned that before, like back when you graduated college and went to Virginia Union, there was no WBA. There were pros. Nope. I mean, there were pros, like probably international, but there was no WBA during that time. But see, the WBA as it is right now, like, and also, there was no Aggies Unlimited, which I saw you attending on your social media, which we'll get into that later in the conversation. So that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. And um, yeah, like when, like during your time, like, why don't you talk a little bit about like which HBCU alum and basketball football landscape inspires you during your career as a player and a coach? What HBCU alum? Yeah, Exp in uh, inspired me. Mm -hmm. You mean like while I was playing? Because I didn't know much about the CIAA coming out the Midwest. Um, and so while I was there, of course, I, I got a chance to meet a lot of the young ladies in the conference. And um, I would say my teammates for the most part, because, you know, I can honestly say I did say I was an avid reading in high, in, in um, high school. And I remember reading about, you know, the plight of blacks in like New York and D.C., and I remember just saying to myself, wow, I would love to have an opportunity to play with women that come out of those environments. Because, of course, if they come out of those environments and they survive them, they're mentally tough, right? They know how to deal with adversity. Um, they are already champions in their own mind. So I was actually fortunate to have the opportunity to play with young ladies out of D.C. and out of New York. And so those would have been like my inspirations right there. But my role model 
from Tennessee State was the uh, late legendary Wilma Rudolph. Now that's a young lady that I aspired because I know she had suffered with polio. She had overcome the odds of her being able to compete and went on to win Olympic gold medals. Yeah, that, that, that's an amazing story right there. The fact that you're able to go, the fact that you're able to experience all that is still becoming, becoming the coach that you are today. That's got to mean something. Well, and you talk about as far as anybody inspired me, definitely my head coach, the late Tricky Tom Harris. I can't say too much about him. He was like a surrogate father to us. He believed in us. He brought us in because he saw the vision. He really did. He saw the vision of turning that women's basketball or athletic women's um, sports program in general around at Virginia Union. I played softball while I was there. We helped start the volleyball player when I was there. So it was a great time for us to be what I consider like trailblazers or pioneers to set the stage for other young ladies to come through. And that was kind of around the horn because we had Norfolk State was still in the CIAA. You had North Carolina Central was in the CIAA. You had Hampton University was in the CIAA. So again, just being able to get around and see those young people compete, I, I was always inspired by that. And then you had the legendary um, Big House Games. Anna Winston Salem, I mean his name alone. You, 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 they just inspired you. It, and I was trying to think a couple of women that was before me as well that it inspired me. Um, and their names have come back to me. But yeah, just being able to see someone that looks like you be able to deal with adversity, be able to uh, 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 have the faith and stay strong and build programs like at those HBCUs, at the Virginia Union, at the Virginia States you know, and so on. You know, you couldn't help but be inspired. You really can't. And the fact, and, and seeing the, the CIAA conference from your playing days and see up until this point, I mean, honestly, I didn't really know about the CIAA until I saw people like, like a lady named Grady Diaz and then lady Tariqa Foster Brasby started covering it, doing journalist work on it. And even though I didn't watch the games, I kind of got a sense of them interviewing and doing on their stand up talking about the, talking about that conference and it got me thinking, how am I going to learn about this? And um, yeah, that's why I'm glad I, that's even more convenient. That I'm glad I met you because you played at that conference. So you, you know, you, you're the big cap. I mean, you had caveats and plugs in that conference. Yeah. I, I'm telling you every year we looked forward to it. It was like, we're going to the CIAA. We're going to win the CIAA because again, it wasn't all just about the basketball, but it was about the camaraderie. It was about being uh, appreciated and celebrated in your skin. Like we didn't have to worry about some of the uh, challenges that I know some of our black students have had to deal with PWIs. You know, we didn't have to worry about that because we were affirmed in our own skin. We felt good about who we were. And then the camaraderie, the fashion, the cheerleaders, the excitement, the dancers. I mean, it was just one big show, and just not only in the basketball, but from the entertainment standpoint as, as well. Exactly. There's a lot of great entertainers that come out of HBCU. It's like, like, yes, why, it is. Why don't you? Talk, we're on the subject. Why don't you talk about some of your favorite actors, and entertainers that come out of HBCUs that you enjoy watching the most? Um, I know Will Downing came out of Virginia Union. So I, I'm excited to promote him out of Virginia Union as an entertainer. I know there were a few other Black artists um, that have come out of the HBCUs. I, I, I can't really, because I don't really get into the entertainment. Dan Howard, Deontay huh? Henson, actor. Um... I thought you was going to say Taraj P. Henson. Yeah, because she came out of Maryland. I'm very familiar with her. She came out of Maryland. Yes. Um, am I, Let's see. Am I, am I forgetting anybody? Am I forgetting anybody? DJ Envy? Yes. Um, Stephen A. Smith. On the Stephen A. Smith came out of Winston-Salem, right? So, yeah. Those, I believe so. Those are just a few. Like, that's why yeah. I had to ask you that question because I want to see, like, if you can remember some, because if you can remember some um, and actors at the tables off the head that came out of HBCUs that made a name for themselves, in it, not just in sports, but in pop culture as well. Yep, yep. But not only in that, we talk about in politics. We're big in politics. You know, we had the first black governor in the state of Virginia, Douglas Wilder, L. Douglas Wilder out of Virginia that attended Virginia Union University. We had some of the first black mayors in the city of Richmond, Mayor Roy West. 
So we go, we've got a, a strong um, heritage, a history at Virginia Union University. You know, of course, like Charles Oakley and Ben Wallace and AJ English, um, those are individuals that went on to do great things. Mm -hmm. And we can't forget about Martin Luther King, who went on uh, Morehouse. More, more, yeah, Morehouse. And, uh, Morehouse, uh, absolutely. I, mean, That's I know right. it was a sports show, but the reason why I kind of mentioned Martin Luther King because, you know, he came up with the infamous I Have a Dream speech, which as we yes. put up until this day. And yeah, the NBA decides to do a holiday after him every January because he's just absolutely. That. That's how much he inspired the later generation. Imagine how Martin Luther King would have. Imagine how Martin Luther King would have felt if he was alive today, seeing that they did a holiday after him. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. I'm glad he's not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. He would not be happy. He would not be happy. Anyway. I, I don't think he. Would um. Be. Yeah. But okay. anyway, yeah, and he was definitely one of my uh, uh, role models as well because I talk about him in my book. You know how um, I remember. Uh, you know, the, 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 the events that led up to his, his death and, and how uh, inspiring he was, again, like you said, with the infamous I Have a Dream speech. So, absolutely. Yes. And to continue the conversation, why don't you talk me a little bit about how, why, why do you think people should attend, like, wh like, what are your overall thoughts of the HBCU All-Star Summer Classic? And why do you think that people, regardless of, of, of the culture and where they grew up, should attend this event and be invested in the HBCU? That's an excellent question. I really feel like they should attend because, number one, these are some great, phenomenal athletes. Again, these are women that have not been able to display their talent on a larger platform, and now they're being given an opportunity to do this. I'm telling you, you all will not be disappointed to come out here and see these young ladies and these young men perform at a level that's amazing. I feel like um, for the most part, as, an, as a black athlete, we have a little bit more when it comes to the skill set and the athleticism. Some of the things that I know I didn't do when I was playing that these young women are doing, and of course the men probably could say the things that they're able to do. And just the, sheer, just the sheer excitement and the joy and the enthusiasm. And then when you see that, I think it's a chemistry there. There's an aura surrounding when, when I see, you know, black athletes out there performing because it's like, that's their world. You know, they, that's, I feel like for me, it was like, that's my world. That's my joy. That's where I live. This, that's where I be. And so if you want to see some great basketball uh, at a higher level, like never before, definitely come out and support these young men and these young women. This is what they do. And, and, and I feel like it's their story. They're telling you their story through their play, through their performance. And so, again, you won't be disappointed. Come on out. It doesn't matter, like you said, what your culture is, your skin, your ethnicity. If you want to come out, have some great fun, be a part of something that's going to be, I know, so it's going to be great for the years to come. And be the one to say, I was there at the first one. So that's what I would say. Come on out and support us. Enjoy these young people. Exactly. Because because Rucker Park, you're always going to get good basketball, well, no matter what type of basketball event you put together. But you but if you want, if you watch my interview with with Rachel, you get a bit of in, in, in that little snippet, in that little piece of it when she posted on the on the page. You get I you already got an idea why people should attend this event, and I figured and, and I figured it's best to actually interview people like you because I understand you're more close to the whole creation process behind it than I am. I mean, I, I didn't okay. go to UCU school, but so what? I want to learn about it. Right, right, yes, yeah, and and, and definitely. Again, and, and just think about what we're going to leave behind for the young people. When they bring their young children, they bring, you know, their, their family members. And when I got the invite to be a coach up at the Rucker Park, you know, I heard nothing but great things about that. That's a legendary place. That's a place that has its own history. And to be a part of that, that's, that's just, that's just um, amazing. It's, it's, it's just a, a dream come through, true for me. And so I'm excited and, and I'm definitely looking forward to everybody coming out, having some great fun, you know, and also building relationships. We talk about what basketball does for us. It allows us to connect on a, on a different level. And so the relationships that you build, you never know down the road, you need some help. Somebody's got a job. Somebody's looking for this or looking for that. To, to coming together with this particular event because we're coming together as one. And I believe there's a theme out there uh, for, for the, uh, the All-Star game. 
and it's just like we celebrating you. We a, a lot of times those individuals don't get celebrated at that higher level, but here's an opportunity for us right now to celebrate them, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, we're, we're happy for you, what you've done. You've left behind a legacy for others to follow because that's what it's all about, right? We stand on the shoulders of somebody who's gone before us. And then we got to continue to elevate that and build that so that the people that come behind us, they can say the same thing. That's what it's all about. But I mean, I know you. I mean, I, only, I know you're probably going to say the same thing you already said. But I'm kind of asking this because we see a lot of other uh, HBCU related basketball events in New York City. You see the Hall of Renaissance classes that takes place that takes place during during the month of November. You see that uh, you see that um, that that, two, that the women you see that little little, little basketball event that takes place at the potential center. I mean, I, for, I forgot what it's called, but it, it'll probably come to me later on in the conversation. But okay. that takes place at the potential center way back in February. If you see the All Star HBU All Star All Star Games that takes place during the NBA All Star break, what makes this different from the other events I just said? Well, I'm not familiar with some of those ones that you mentioned, but I know that this one is this the only one that's outside, or are okay. the other ones more inside? The, the other ones are more inside. Yeah, so I would say that would to me that would be one distinguishing uh, thing that's different. The fact that it's outside, it's in the air. It, it, it's probably, I, I'm, I'm claiming it's gonna be a beautiful day. People are caught up in the energy. So I'm saying, I, I feel like that's gonna be an advantage of being outside and just, just being free and just allowing everything to, to unfold just like like music, you know, just just beautifully, that that har harmony, that, 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 that flow. So I think that that would be one of the advantages of having outside. And then again, I'm saying this again, we're celebrating another group of young people, right? Those other uh, events, they're celebrating those groups of individuals. So now we get a chance to celebrate another group of young people. And I feel like the more we celebrate them, the more we show them that we care about them, then I feel like that adds value to their lives. And then they too will want to go and give back because that's what it's all about. It's all about giving back. So I tell my basketball team, it's never about you. It's about us. It's about we, as Muhammad Ali would say, right? Not I, but we. Yes, that's what it's all about. And make sure everybody goes to Rucker Park on August 5th to check out the HBCU All-Star Summer Classic. Promise you, you're going to see a basketball story told in a very different way from all the other HBCU stories that, that even you managed to muster together from being a player at Virginia Union to now being head coach, which we will get to, to in, a, in a second. But, 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 but to, to, to take to dance off the HBCU for a minute, why don't we talk about, about, about your time attending Athletes Unlimited and what made, what made you want to go away down to Texas to see some of the same WBA talents we see, see right now in the in the play, you're playing right now at Athletes Unlimited. At the Athletes Unlimited? Yes. So I got a chance to attend that. I, I was excited. My good uh, business partner, girlfriend, Robin um, Gray, has her own um, muscle recovery business in Dallas. And so she actually was one of the trainers and she was able to get me some tickets. And so I went out there for like three weeks. I hung out. And I'm telling you, again, just to see those young women, and majority of them were former WNBA ball players, and majority of them came from, you know, the PWIs. But just the level of play, the skill set, like Melissa Smith, who was one the MVP of, of the Athletes Unlimited event, and she's now playing with the Indiana, Indiana Fever. This young woman is nothing but the truth. It's amazing just to watch her game, Monster. her rebounding, her finishing around the rim. And I'm just trying to remember the young lady that we're celebrated, we celebrated that passed away. She was the first black, she was the first female to get recruited by the NBA and she passed. And I'm gonna come, I'm gonna remember her name. Um, and she decided that she didn't want to uh, uh, play, but she would have been the first black female or first female in general to break the mold to play in the NBA. But Alyssa Smith just kind of reminded me of her, her skill set, her ability to get up and down the court. I saw uh, uh, Chelsea, uh, 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 I can't think of Chelsea's last name, but it comes Chelsea, to me out of Ohio you, State. Chelsea Gray? No, Yes, Kelsey Gray. Yes, no, not not Kelsey Gray. Um, Chelsea, it'll come to me. She played at Ohio State. Uh, she set the three point record. Um, to see um, Jordan um, Kennedy, to see uh, 
all those young ladies, the names will start coming to me, but just to watch them play, it was just amazing, uh, the style of play. And I believe, and I might be speaking a little too forward, but I feel like that's the type of play that we're going to see at Rucker Park. These young ladies are going to come out here and they're going to show you and say, this is why I should be considered for the WNBA. This is why I should be able to get picked up by the Athletes Unlimited. This is why I should earn a contract overseas because my skill set in itself says that I am capable of playing at the highest level. Exactly. And my fault for looking for looking up something when I was actually looking up that that um HBCU event that takes place at the Prudential Center way like a couple months ago back in February. You know, I believe it was in February 2nd. You know, it, it, it's, gonna, it's probably gonna come to me if not in this episode, later conversations the next time you come on the show. But yeah, that's pretty much it. So um Okay. Yeah, because I think um well the men had there, that was Chris Paul's. Uh Chris Paul had yeah, it was his, my, um, I know it was hosted by Michael B. Jordan. I know it was I know Michael yeah, B. Jordan, another HBC alum, by the way, put together was it was the host of that event. It was at the yes. center. So yeah, it was that one. And Virginia Union men won it twice, back to back. Go V U U. Yeah, I know that's exciting. I know that's exciting for you. Yes, absolutely. That's why I hang my head. You know, just to be able to play there, bring a national title home, have two CIAA back-to-backs, get my jersey hung in the Raptors, come back and coach there, get coach of the year, win a Northern Division, and then most recently, a couple of years ago, came back to be an adjunct professor. So again, that's what it does for you going to an HBCU, being able to come back again, come back again. And I, I think I'm not going to say they can't happen at the other institutions, but I know that happens also often at the HBCUs because it's, we know the history. We know the culture. We know how to deal with our young people. And that's so important. Exactly. And now to talk a little bit about your career as a head coach, like what, 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 is, the, what is the experience like being able to coach, coach the, young, the, the, new, the next generation of stars that could be playing, if not in the WNBA, the Air Nationally, or at least Athletes Unlimited? Well, you know what? We have to make adjustments. I'm not going to uh, uh, run away from who I am as a person. My, my integrity is in place. Uh, what I believe and how I operate it when it comes to discipline and how I run my teams, that's always going to stay in place. But in terms of these newer players, we have to make the adjustments, right? Because these newer players have to understand what it takes to get to that next level. It, it can't be just your talent. It's got to be about your hard work. It's about to be your commitment and you got to have a strong work ethic. And I feel like as long as we continue to communicate this to the young people, because the lines of communication for me are so important. I tell my ball players all the time, you know, if they don't, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so it's not about me giving into them and them being able to do what they want to do and say what they want to do. That's not what I'm saying. But you got to be able to have that line of communication and open and talk with them. See what's going on with them behind the scenes. Because a lot of times we don't understand, we don't know, but that doesn't excuse them for not being able to perform on the court. But when they feel like they've got somebody that has a listening ear, that's willing to work with them, that's willing to encourage them, that's willing to push them, and then to show them how much they care, I feel like that's a win-win situation. And a lot of athletes have expressed that to me where they play with teams or for coaches and they felt like they didn't care. All they wanted them to do was to go out there and perform. You know, it's much more than that. It's really much more exactly. than that. Exactly. There's much more to basketball than just being a good basketball player. You have to have academic skills. You have to have the, have, have the mentality to actually get on the court. That's something that's something that you need to get in order to make it to the pros. Because if you if you have a if you if you don't have that much of a like good life off the court, they may have a that might lead to a conversation. Look at John Moran and his gun situation. Look at John Morant. Yeah, Morant. I'm like, come on now. But see, that's what I'm saying. Who is in his ear? Think about Allen Iverson. What did his mother do? She went down there and got him and cleaned him up. Now, y'all not going to do that. And look at Kevin Durant's mom. Look what she's done with her son. See, those young people need guidance. And a lot of times, we think that they're adults. They're adults, and they can handle those uh, 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 challenges or those uh, uh, adversities and, or that new situation, and they can't. They're just 18 and 19 year old. And science has already proved you still not fully, mind is not fully developed until you're 25. So come on, what are we expecting these 18 to 19 year olds to make these big decisions with what? 
They don't have a basis. They don't have a framework. They don't have any experience to make those right decisions. So that's why I said being able to have the lives of communication, open with your players, talk to them and find out what's going on and then provide them with some guidance. And structure is very important too. Exactly. You gotta give them a plan. You gotta give them a plan. And you talked about, we talked about character, right? How important it is to build strong character? What does character mean, right? Character means doing the right things when somebody's not even around you or making you do it. So again, those are uh, those intangibles that young people need to have, like you said, the right mindset. What's the right mindset? Well, we got to teach that. We can't expect them to know that because again, think about when you were 18. Think about when I was 19. We thought we knew that, but we didn't. We were clueless. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of felt the same way too. I mean, well, well I mean, I, well, before we get back to the coach, I mean, I want—I I forgot to ask this later, earlier in the interview, but what would you, what would you say, like some of the positions that you played during your play days, is, and like, what are some of your specialties as a basketball player, and how did that help you become the person you are today, even as a coach? Well, like I said, I tell you what, just being out there playing with the boys in the neighborhood, I had to get fierce. I had to be a competitor. So I love trying to steal the ball. That was one of my one of my little pet peeves because I knew if I stole the ball, I can get down the court because I was quick and I could make the layup. And so in high school, I normally played uh, the two and the three position. I, I could shoot the uh, – So I was just saying I love to be, you know, running the, the court, you know, getting the easy layups. I became a mid-range mid expert. I come off screens. I pull the jumper. You know, I can get to the basket, finish my layups. And one of my best part of the game that I learned was to be a great rebounder. So I'm 5'9", but what I realized, I didn't know this was about myself in high school, but by the time I got to college, by my junior year, I just realized I had long, I have long arms, right? And so I have quickness. So I would always beat my opponent to the rebound. And most people, when the ball goes up, everybody's looking up in the air. And I knew that. And I would just sneak around them. I get a little put back and I get finished and I get uh, and one and go to the hole. So uh, that part of my game, I definitely built it. I, I'm a strong rebounder. That's, I have a knack for that. And I'm a mid-range shooter. I can knock it down on the backboard. I can get to the basket. I can finish around the rim. And then over time, I developed my defensive mindset. Because what I realized is that if I stole the ball back again, if I got in the passing lane, that was going to either be a bucket for me or an assist to my teammate. Wow. That, I mean, based on everything you explained, that sounds like a Stephen Curry, Josh Hart style of play. Because <laughs> those are the only players I can think of that can, that can play in that type of mentality as a basketball player. And being able to teach that as a coach. Yes. A yes. Because it was like anticipation. Like it was almost like my peripheral view is just, you know, it's 100. I'm going to say that about myself. And I would just make them think that person was open. I just, you know, okay, I'm going to do. It's kind of it's kind of almost like the Jordan, uh, Michael Jordan, like just freeze people. Just stand there. Just wait. And mm -hmm. so you, you find yourself caught up in a rhythm that's different from the other player. And when you realize that, you know, that's kind of almost like, I think it's almost like grand up for boxing. Like, okay, I. I'm already knowing, I'm already ahead, I'm all strategically, I'm already got it in my mind, I'm already in the game. And that's why I tell my ball players a lot, when you're on the floor, you got to be in the game. And they say, no, 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 you got to be in the game. So anything that's happening on my right and my left, I'm totally oblivious to that because I'm so caught up in the game. And when you're caught up in the game and you, you, you always like a chess move, right? I'm making the next move, I'm making the next move, I'm making the next move. And so that's why I try to teach my ball players. Yeah, you got you have to teach your ball players how to do that because how how they expect to be, become the next generational talent if they don't learn from one of the best coaches or in, in in that particular community. Yes, 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 and so that's what I loved about the game. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, before they uh, changed the clock, because when I was playing, the clock only went to double digits, right? Mm -hmm. Eighty nine, two digits, and I remember in Barco our clock only went to two digits. And so we would get caught up and say, we're going to make that clock sing because we would score over 100 points a lot of games. We'd be 101, 103 because we had that team chemistry and that excitement. I mean, I can tell you right now, I never wanted the game to end. The game was over. I was like, can we play another half? Can we play another quarter? 
because I was in the game and the game was where I lived. It was that joy, that excitement, that enthusiasm. And then all of a sudden I would say, every time they would go like, it's number 31, Barbenio Wooten. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go get another bucket. I'm going to get another rebound. I'm going to get another steal. So that was another part that motivated me in my game. Wow. That, that, that's, that's amazing. Now, that, that's amazing. And, I, and I'm glad you're able to, to experience all that and become the person you are today. But and to, to, get, to continue the conversation, I mean, well, when, when you first saw the WNBA, it came out in 1997 and seeing the way it's evolved right now, what are your overall impressions about its league and its importance to sports culture? Well, let me just say this. Before the WNBA, there was a, the National Women's Basketball League. And I played in that for 10 years and we traveled all over the country. Uh, that was my first experience with quote unquote women's professional basketball. And then the ABL, the American, you remember the Air American Basketball League? I, right before the WNBA. Yeah. And those players like Don Staley, right? Uh, Lisa Leslie, um, Teresa Edwards, uh, Teresa Witherspoon. I, I could go on. They were they were in existence for about one year. Now I, because I had the passion and the desire to play at that level, I finally got a opportunity to try out for the team for it was the Richmond Rage, but they moved to Philadelphia. And that's the team that Don Staley played on. And her assistant coach, Lisa Boyer, was her head coach for that team. I made the practice squad and then uh the uh player of uh of uh, development came and talked to me and they were ready to move me up to player status, but some things happened in my home and I couldn't continue it. So I had my experience. And then two years later, I tried out for the uh, Phoenix Mercury. I played tried out for the New York Liberty. I tried out for the Washington Mystics. So I, I continue even into my late thirties. I still tried out for those teams and I felt very confident that I could have made those teams, but you know, sometimes things are political and that was okay. But I knew deep down inside that I was capable of playing at that level. Matter of fact, I'm still playing with my team when I get an opportunity to. Wow. So you, you, yeah. you actually have some pro experience. Since, I mean, I, I mean that, that's a good education right there. I mean, I'm sure other basketball people people know about that, those leagues before the WBA even came about. But but seeing the way the WBA evolved right now, you went from the yes. original teams, like the, like the ones you just mentioned, even teams that don't really exist, like the Houston Comics, that create a dynasty after your the three business. years right. dynasty. That's right, Houston Comics. Right now, yes. right, right now, you got twelve teams with only four of them not making the playoffs, and you got the, you got this commissioner's cup going on, and and, and, and Coach Kathy Engelberg is talking about a possible expansion of the, of yes. the, of the NBA, and I hope it happens soon. But if you were in the league right now, like what, what scene would you want a WNBA team in? Which state would I want a team in? Yes. Well, see, um, where I would want one is different than where it should be. Now, I'm a native of Ohio, and uh, the only team they have out there is the Chicago Sky. I think you can get a team in in Ohio, somewhere around that Cleveland, Cincinnati. They had the Cleveland Rockers. They did have the Cleveland Rockers, I remember. They had the Cleveland Rockers, absolutely. There you go. That's right. They had the um, Columbus um, Trail Bl uh, Blaze. What was it? Columbus Blaze? Um, yeah, they had they had two teams in there. They had a Columbus team and a Cleveland team. You're absolutely right. So that's what I would like to see. And uh, and maybe um, back in North Carolina or back down in Florida because they had teams down there. You know, they had the... Um, I, know they had the I know they had the Miami Soul and then the Char and they had the Charlotte, Charlotte State. State. I, the Charlotte I watched State. Charlotte State. Play I seen the Charlotte State play in real life back in 2006, by the way, for those who... With Don Staley. Yeah. No, well, not the Don Staley days, but I'm talking about like as its last few years during the 10-year anniversary WBA season when they were bad. Oh, oh, but you know she played for that team though. Oh yeah, I knew. Don okay. Staley's the goat. He's the goat. She's That's the goat. Why Asia Wilson is what it, where she is right now. I mean, Asia and Aaliyah Boston. Boston. And Aaliyah and Boston. Boston. We just see it do a double double little the spanking of the oh, Western Mix. Yes. With the, with the end of that in the end of fever. I'm like, yeah. Fever, I mean, I didn't watch it because, you know, I was, because, you know, I mean, I didn't watch it, but I saw his stats. I was like, wow, Indiana Fever is probably, they, they're probably, they, they legit. They legit. They have, they're they they not going to be good, but they, but they have a future. Aaliyah yep. Boston, that, 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 is that goats. Yep. And it was Kelsey Mitchell who I was saying the shooting guard, because she's with Indiana Fever, the shooting guard. Yeah. 
in addition to the, uh, the other guard that they have. But they're making some noise. But, yeah, you know, I'm excited about the WNBA, like you said. And, and I, I believe it's definitely time for expansion, either expansion or increase the roster. Because right now, what is it, 12 players, 12 teams, 144 women. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, the league that I'm a part of now, the Women's American Basketball Association, I felt like if we did a lot more marketing and got some big uh, 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 investors behind us, we could be another competitive league that might be conjoined with the WNBA to have more teams and create different divisions in different regions. Because right now, look how long it took the uh, NBA, you know, to, to, to get going. What, 25 plus years? Mm -hmm. before it really got off to a great start that it is now, what is 33 teams? Yeah, it's 32 teams. And, it's part, and, and obviously because it's merged with the ABA. And it, mer it merged with the ABA, exactly. So it's the same thing. And, and that's why it's important, and back to your question and what you were asking and what we were saying, that's why we need people to come out to Rucker Park so they can see these young women and men perform at a level that says we need more teams. We need more, you know, we need more uh, opportunities for these people to play at that professional level. Yeah, exactly. We've got players that came from the LSU championship team earlier this year and they didn't even make the Connecticut and the one player that did, they get dropped, I believe it's Alexis Moore, she didn't even make the roster. Disrespect. Well, well, I don't know about so much of disrespect. I'm just saying they had a whole lot. You know, they had three rounds of 15 young ladies, 45 people. What are we going to do with 45 young ladies? I know, but come on now. That's a national champion. She's a lottery pick. She could have. Like, she could have. She could have. But 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 I'm like I like the way she handled it though. I really do. Mm -hmm. She handled it well. She didn't initially, but she handled it well. Cause see, it's all about how you handle things. Timing is everything. Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan got cut. Come on now. But he didn't give up, did he? Yep, he never gave up. That's what I'm saying. So adversity for me is an opportunity to make you strong and make you fight harder for something that you say you really have a passion and love for. And that's what it's all about. And uh, since that's you right. mentioned ABL, early, excuse me, the ABA earlier, in the, like I mean, we talked. Since you mentioned ABA the merger with the NBA, there's a former ABA team that won a championship this week for the first time ever after making it to the finals for the first time ever. As the number one seed for the first time ever, the Phoenix uh, team that's been to seven NBA finals was, was, and sadly has a losing record. And it's the Denver Nuggets. They won yes. the Phoenix Miami five ga four games to one. So uh, why don't you give your overall thoughts on the Denver Nuggets finally achieving their goal of winning a championship? Well, because I didn't watch them as much because I've really been working to build my organization, my women's professional basketball team, and I plugged into a game of there. But just to take a look at the the history and 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 how they went about building it, and that's the one that, that's the thing we can use that analogy and say that's what we want people to understand. Everything is not given to you. There's an opportunity for you to work at something, and when you put the right people together, you have the right mindset you have the right strategy, it's going to happen. They say you can never stop an idea whose time has come. It was their time. This is something they, they were building on. Nobody probably expected that, but they did. They had a plan. It was behind the scenes. And that's why I tell a lot of young people, you don't see the work that people put into other than when you see them at their highest performing. Behind the scenes is grit. Is hard work, is sacrifices, is determination. And then all we see is what? The finished product. And so that's what I would say about the Denver Nuggets. That's what happened. Seeing the finished product. Me and my co-host, me and my co-host who's an alum at Cheney University, by the way, they, we talk about that all the time. Seeing the finished product. Not only few can see how the product is being worked on towards it being finished. But the, but uh, but but the entire world is seeing the finished product. The Denver Nuggets literally made the finished product. They had to work. The, they had to work for the ground up. Forty-seven years of not seeing the NBA Finals from the Alex English days to the Mellow days to the Kenneth Reed days. Now Nikola Jokic, a forty-first. Oh wow! For selection, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter saw... Jr., Aaron Gordon, who came in the trade a few years ago. High five. 
they came together and he finally got the job done. Oh, yeah, DeAndre Jordan, who at his prime couldn't get it done with the Clippers in the Nets, but at least right now he has a ring. So I got to give much respect to the Denver Nuggets for finally yes. keeping the goals. Because they begin with the end in mind. And that's what we tell young people a lot. That's what I would say, even in the Alexis Morrison situation. Let's not get distraught because it didn't happen right now. Timing is everything. But if you believe in what you are trying to accomplish, you have the vision, you stay true to that, it has to happen. It has to happen. When it's going to happen, I don't know. But guess what? It is going to happen. And now only happen with enough focus. You just saw, I mean, like, like, look, you just got selected to be involved with the HBCU All Stars of a Classic. And that only happened with enough mindset, with the right mindset in basketball. Yep. And that's, a, and I feel the same way because I was telling my team, I was like, wow, I get a call and I'm like, I'm honored. I, I, I'm thankful because I have put in the work, right? All of the work and the heart, the sacrifices and getting out here, beating the pavement day after day, pushing my women, bringing in uh, individuals to help them be better, uh, uh, out here networking, and it's paid off. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm also excited that my uh, national team, we're getting ready to be inducted. We were just inducted into the CIAA Hall of Fame. Now our alma mater, Virginia Union, is getting ready to induct us into its Hall of Fame. So I always say that's going to be six Hall of Fames for me. And again, it's personal testament to the work that I put in, not thinking about trying to get into a Hall of Fame, right? Not thinking about I'm going to go and do this. It was just the, 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 the passion and the desire just to be the best at what I do. And so I tell my young people, when you make up your mind and whatever it is that you choose to do, be the best at that. Didn't Dr. King say that in his speech? If you're going to be a janitor, be a damn good one. Whatever you're going to be, be good at it. And when you do that, things will unfold naturally for you. It will indeed. And we'll wrap up this episode not to put that sports star. Thank you okay. so, so much, Coach Wooten, for coming on the show. And shout out to Rachel, for the yes. author, for my little tomboy, for making this interview happen. And don't forget to check out the All the Rest, excuse me, on the HBCU All-Star Summer Classic coming up at Rucker Park. And yeah, you know Mike Larry's going to kill on the mic, so that's <laughs> another exciting part about it. Another Black man doing things in the community. So Absolutely. It's all well, about thank you there, including you. Get your head in the game. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We'll see you all on August the 5th at Rucker Park.